Okay, so good afternoon, everybody. <clears throat> and uh, we're now embarking on the second part of our journey to the uh, discovery of the Higgs boson and, and beyond. Just to re remind you from uh, where we stopped at the last lecture, we had um, the Atlas detector construction and installation at the interaction point number one at the LHC. Now, during the construction, there was quite a lot of preparatory work for operating the experiment, which was uh, necessary. And I show you here a slide from, well, 2008, where we were discussing actually the strategy towards the physics. So before the data taking, it's very important that during the construction, there was very strict quality control on all the components. And then there was a long uh, period where in test beams, the detector parts were uh, calibrated, were developed, and where it was really checked that they perform what we will need for making physics discoveries. Of course, this was also used actually then to uh, tune already the Monte Carlo, uh, uh, the Monte Carlo simulation of the detector. And third, before really beam came, it was clear we wanted to commission as much as possible the detector already uh, in position in the underground cavern. And then our plan was that with the first data, one would, in a way, rediscover the physics, the known physics of the standard model. For example, looking at the resolution for the WZ bosons, the TT bar, and so on, looking at QCD jets. All this itself, of course, is interesting physics, but it was also used really to tune the Monte Carlo generators. So let's see how this proceeded. So I give you here first uh, two examples. One example from the quality control during the construction of the detector. This is concerning here the electromagnetic perimeter, which is absolutely uh, crucial for getting the solution. We eventually find the Higgs into two photon decays or the Higgs uh, when measuring the case involving electrons. So, I remind you the electromagnetic calorimeter is a liquid argon sampling calorimeter with lead plates in this accordion shape, as you see on the lower right uh, photograph. It has on, for example, one end, it has something like 1,500 uh, plates. These plates have a thickness of 2.2 millimeter and the thickness must be for to nine micro or, or in order to ensure that there are no systematic uh, non-uniformity in the calorimeter. Our goal was to be well below 1% of uh, the uniformity response. And put seven of these modules in test pieces, then scanned over the whole uh, surface over the whole geometry of these modules to check the uniformity, the response uniformity, and you can see the top plot both for arrow and for end caps. This was really well below the 1% lines which are shown here. So that was a big, big effort. And of course, if one would have made a mistake at this stage, you would have it for the whole life of the Atlas experiment. So this is very important when uh, constructing an experiment. Then 
we needed really to understand uh, also the uh, boundaries, for example, when you cross particles measuring from one calorimeter into another. What the figure shows, this diagram up on the upper right corner is the layout of the end cap electromagnetic calorimeter and then you see part of the barrel. And of course, depending on the angle with respect to the beam axis, you want to be sure that you understand actually the response. The response will transit from the forward calorimeter and then you at somewhat larger angle or pseudo rapidities, you go into the end cap, hadronic and electromagnetic end cap calorimeter and finally, you would go into the barrel part. And we have mapped out again in a test beam uh, with very high precision and high details, the different response now varying this angle of incident. This one can do in a test beam because one, if one has a cryostat and one can move it on a movable uh, platform. Finally, an example also about commission of the detector in the ground can I wonder is this at all possible yes. because there are from cosmic rays uh, still a lot of muons also 100 meter underground. Remember the Atlas cavern is about 100 meter uh, underground. In fact, they are typically something like well, between half to 100 muon reverse detector. What, the sh what you see here is a picture, a simulation of grace, what they expect in the detector. So even years before really the beams were turned on, one could use these muons to make sure everything is working. And I just show you here an example of such a tray uh, measurements. Well, on the event display on the upper right, you see the layout of the Atlas experiment, and then in red, a cosmic ray which traverses the whole detector. So, do seven things. For example, you can check that the track segment you measure in the muon system is really matched with what you measure in the inner tracking detector. And this um, thing is shown the uh, plot where you see the very clear correlation between the, what you measure in the muon spectrometer and what you measure in the inner detector. You can also check, for example, if your ideas about the energy loss of the muons in the material of the calorimeter are correct. So you can compare what you measure for the muon momentum when it comes here to the detector. Uh, four enters the calorimeter, the exit, and you measure again the momentum outside with the spectrometer. You see actually that these two momenta do not match up. They are uh, displaced by about uh, 3 GV and that's the typical amount of energy lost by a muon going through the iron in particular of the other calorie which is shown here in red. So the typical uh, things which have been done a lot in the few years before the beam was uh, turned on. All this was also very useful actually to check one important aspect of the experiment that is uh, the whole trigger data acquisition and the software chain. Now fortunately uh, Mario did talk quite a bit about the trigger aspect so I don't need to say much about that. There is a trigger system which uh, has a first stage selection on the ground and then take computer files top of the Atlas pit to make more refined 
selection of the events. And from there, they are then uh, sent into the, what is called the uh, worldwide LHC computing grid, which connects in a kind of hierarchical way, uh, the CERN computer center, the tier zero, where the data is uh, stored also. And then uh, it's transmitted to large computer facilities in many regions. And from there, further on into uh, tier two and even tier three uh, facilities. So this what computing grid had to be developed as well. It uh, is featured in, uh, end of, in, in the next transparencies. Just to give you some numbers, there are uh, 12 very large tier one computer centers in different regions of the world and more than 100 tier two centers where actually then the physicists from the different collaborating institutes can access uh, the data. Now, the story of the LHC was not all the time completely smooth. And if I talk about the history, I should also say that there was a setback, the so-called LHC incident, because in eight, 2008, when <clears throat> the experiment was installed and when we expected to have the first beams, uh, there was beginning of September to some um, be circulating in the machine. Then there was a short interruption. And during that interruption, the machine engineers wanted to test really the um, powering the magnets at their full, uh, full current to get eventually the full energy in the machine. And what happened is actually that one of the uh, connections between two magnets, as it is shown here, uh, was not soldered correctly. This needs to be superconducting. When it's not, uh, when it loses superconductivity, it uh, heats up and it caused uh, an arc which uh, released a lot of the helium which is uh, needed to uh, cool down the magnet. And when you release helium, expand by a factor of 100 from, uh, or 1,000 even, when going from liquid to gaseous uh, form. And that really was like a, like a bomb, so to speak. So, uh, in fact, where this happened, magnets were uh, displaced. And you can imagine that all these uh, very delicate connections, which are shown here, these are the cables which have to be uh, well connected, which carry 12,000 amperes. Uh, well, there was a lot of damage and it took 15 months to repair actually uh, take out some of these magnets, rebuild them essentially, put back the magnets and start up the machine again. So you can imagine that, uh, well, it, as I said, 15 months uh, later, in end of 2009, people in the control room were very anxious what would happen this time when turning on the machine. And well, fortunately enough, everything went well and uh, we saw in fact on November 23rd to obtain the first collisions and that is the picture which was seen. So uh, that was the, the first time that we saw evidence in ATLAS that's actually protons just at the injection energy at that moment uh, collided and you see here the tracks coming out as seen in the silicon detectors of the inner detector. Of course, that was just the beginning. And then the real uh, joy came a little bit later, namely in the end of March 2010, when the beams were also accelerated, 
accelerated to uh, 3.5 TV. So we saw the first collisions really at uh, 7 TV. Notice that 7 TV, that is what we started to work. The machine is really planned to operate at 14 TV. Now this uh, value of the energy was chosen to be on the safe side. We wanted the machine to work and not to have another incident. So uh, uh, this picture also shows very nicely that uh, we had a, a nice um, toast to the machine builders, uh, in particular it, the project leader of the machine, Lynn Evans, and at that time Fabiola Cianotti was already uh, the spokesperson. Since then, uh, two major runs have been taking place in LHC. What we call the run one was from 2009 to 2012. And the machine has really worked uh, beautifully. We have accumulated something in that time of the order of 20, 25, uh, inverse Fentoban. Just to give you a number, this corresponds to something like uh, 2 times 10 to the 15 collisions. Maybe you remember from the first lecture, I introduced the fact that we expected to see, for example, uh, detectable Higgs uh, boson at the level of 2 times 10 to the 13 collisions. So you can already figure out that we should have seen the Higgs and we did indeed. Maybe uh, another comment, actually the experiments, they have recorded typically 94% or so of the, of the luminosity delivered by the machine and then typically 90% of the overall was used in the final analysis. Um, just to show you here a summary of the different performances in the first year in run one, these are uh, up to something like 20 inverse Fentoban. This was good run, last of run of one. As I said, 20 inverse Fentoban. And then in run two, which was from 2015 to 2018, after uh, reworking all the connections in the superconducting magnet one went up to 13 TV and has accumulated something like a total of something like 150 or so inverse Ventoban. This uh, high intensity of uh, collisions, of course, poses quite some uh, challenges to the experiment. This is a typical event where there have been 25 uh, proton pairs per bunch colliding and you have to get out of course the interesting collisions in that in this case it was a z into mu plus mu minus uh, below you see a distribution of the number of interactions per crossing and this is usually called uh, mu a bit confusing because mu we will also use for something else later on. But as you can see in the last run, it was typically something like, uh, well, 35, 35 collision uh, per uh, bunch crossing. So this really did very good in the detectors. Okay, so now let us go to the physics, and this is just. To, for you for a reference again, a very old plot where we knew the uh, hierarchy in a way of physics events we would expect. So 1990, uh, well before the machine was working, the total cross section, something like 80 uh, milliban, and then many, many orders of magnitude below the WZ cross section, TT bar, and we knew that the new physics, for example, the Higgs, depending on its mass, would be at the level 
of uh, something like 100 or less uh, femtobands. This plot is also convenient because you can read up just the number of events uh, per year you would accumulate uh, for a luminosity of 10 to the 34, which was the design luminosity. Okay, so uh, when we turned on the machine, uh, even in 2010, in the first few months, it was very nice to see actually a long history of particle physics. I show here the dimuon mass spectrum, which was accumulated, this is just in a, in a month or so. And you can see all the, the famous particles which were discovered uh, decades ago, like for example, the eta, the, the phi, shape psi in 1974, then the upsilon family, this high uh, accuracy measured, for example, here by CMS in 28, and the Z discovery as, uh, as you remember in 83. Okay, so let me show you now some of this uh, physics, which I said we need to to convince ourselves that uh, we are capable to, to measure it, to prove that the experiment works if we want to make a discovery, but which in itself has a lot of uh, physics and which is a big source of, uh, of uh, physics analysis, which we are doing. So I start with the high PT jet. This is now a very uh, dramatic jet event, uh, two jet event, which has a total jet jet mass of almost seven TV. And uh, you see here again on this Lego plot, which I introduced the last time, uh, the energy uh, deposited. So we have made a lot of very detailed uh, measurements of jet production. That means studying the quantum chromodynamics in very, very great details. What this shows, for example, is just the simplest case, namely two jet events, the in inclusive jet cross-section. They are displaced here a little bit uh, for different rapidity uh, ranges. And in order to compare this really with QCD on such a um, highly logarithmic scale, of course, you don't really see how precisely do you understand QCD. So what one typically does is one actually plots the theory over data, the ratio. So if you understand uh, this data very well, and if it agrees with the theory, you would expect that the points all line up at one. And this is again for different angular regions, different rapidity region. And you can see one can of course, compare this with a very sophisticated uh, QCD calculations and, and uh, also uh, next to leading order perturbative calculations using different part on distribution functions and so on. That is a lot of physics uh, content in this. Just for uh, fun, this is for those who, like me, who have been working at many uh, previous colliders. This was the inclusive cross section at uh, the PBRP collider at CERN, and then here the, at the Fermi lab. And you see you reach much further out now with uh, the LHC. The second uh, important candle in a way to show that the experiment works, and again, is very nice physics, is looking for the W and Z bosons. In fact, the LHC produces them in hundreds of millions by now. So that's how a typical uh, w looks like in the decay for an electron and the neutrino. So you see why you need 
a hermetic detector because you want to be sure there is nothing balancing uh, this stiff electron track, which also has electromagnetic uh, signal here, uh, which indirectly through the ETMIS gives us the uh, neutrino signature, or this is a typical uh, Z boson decaying into mu plus mu minus. It's just shown here in this uh, event display in the toroid system and the precision chambers in the toroid system. So one of the basic things you can do is to measure the cross section for example, W uh, production and the W decaying into a lepton, that means here electron or muon and its corresponding neutrino. And you see that it's very well described by uh, QCD, higher order QCD uh, calculations. And these are the measurements from earlier times. You can notice here something uh, quite interesting, namely uh, for the LHC, here 7, 8, and 13 TV. The results are shown separately for W plus in green and in brown for W minus uh, production. And of course, at the LHC where you collide proton, proton, you have a larger cross section for the W plus. This is not the case at the P bar P colliders like at the Tevatron it was or at, uh, at uh, the P bar P collider at CERN. Now, one thing is just to observe W and, and C and measure their cross section, but we want to measure them with very high precision. And I show you here some example plots how precisely you actually understand your detector. This is, for example, the Z peak measured both with uh, events where you have high um, interaction rate. I mentioned this mu factor or a low interaction rate, so they perfectly well overlap and they also are described perfectly well by the Monte Carlo. When I say perfectly well, without going again into too much uh, details, I just show you that uh, this is typically at the level of a fraction of a percent, actually at the level of per mils. These are both uh, shown here for electrons and also for uh, muons. You can look at that in, in leisure a bit in more uh, detail. This is very important because we want one of the, the challenges is to measure with this huge amount of uh, Ws, for example, its mass. And uh, one measure its mass by measuring the transverse mass, which I mentioned already in the case uh, of the Tevatron before. You see here the uh, transverse mass distribution, for example, for the W in electrons or the W in muons. You can fit this distribution and extract actually the mass of the W to this very high precision. And when I say a very high precision, it is indeed, uh, you see here the measurement of uh, ATLAS which is shown here, compared, for example, to the precision of the lab experiment. Next of the known particles is the top. This is the heaviest elementary particle we know. And uh, remember, it has been discovered at the Tevatron. And uh, this here is an event display <clears throat> now from the ATLAS experiment, W uh, the T, T bar decaying into W and the B, W and the B, for example, uh, the W's decaying leptonically. And for the B, we have the typically measurable uh, displaced vertices. On the upper right, 
uh, you see this uh, blown up what happens here just around the interaction point. So again, one as one of the most uh, primary measurement, one can measure the cross section. This has been measured at the LHC again with uh, high precision. This is at certain uh, TV and uh, compared to the uh, QCD, higher order QCD calculations. Here are details, namely using X to X to lead order calculations. One also measures mass. Of course, again, we, have, we don't have a mass uh, chart peak because of the neutrinos, but one can uh, construct a top mass, well, ignoring using the transverse momentum, missing transverse momentum, and then one can again, uh, shape, uh, fit the shape of this distribution, and one extracts, for example, a top mass, uh, which is given here with this precision. And uh, notice this precision matches already again, the one which was measured at lower energies. We will come to that. The top mass measurement and the, uh, uh, the W mass measurement and the Higgs uh, mass measurement, they are related and they should, uh, they give us a consistency test of the uh, standard model. So a lot of top physics is, is made. And just to give you the very latest uh, news, from the ATLAS experiment, one can even observe the production of four tops of, uh, and uh, this cross section is of course much, much lower than the TT bar cross section, but uh, it has been established, not yet the discovery, but established at the 4.3 standard deviation. So this we call evidence, as you have learned uh, from A.M. Gross's uh, lecture. One can also use the top for a, a very interesting measurement, namely, as we, it's such a clean and abundant source of Ws, the TT bar production. One can actually look and compare uh, the ratio where the W case not in a in an electron and the neutrino, but the tau and the tau neutrino. And uh, lepton uh, universality, except for very, very small direction, should predict that this ratio should be one if one looks at the A in tau or in tau. And this is a very uh, recent result of Atlas within 1%, you see it increase in fact. So it solves somewhat a very long outstanding puzzle because the lab experiments, they measured something which was more like 1.7 or so, but with a large area. So this also shows you that, okay, um, we have to take errors uh, seriously. This was only about uh, 2.5 sigma away from one. So uh, this can happen, such fluctuations. Uh, going further in the uh, known physics, one can look at, at the boson pair production. This is an example of a display of a WC uh, production where the C is goes in mu plus mu minus the W in electron neutrino. And just one more for uh, the historical uh, context. Actually, this was measured by Atlas uh, in uh, run one already. And these were the points from Atlas in run one, and then it was measured in run two. And as you can see, the red line, that was actually the best um, theoretical calculation at that time. And then the, our theory friends, they uh, immediately went to work and 
uh, from the next to leading order calculations came up with next to next to leading order calculations, which uh, nicely uh, describes the result. So we were hoping we have found something new, but okay, it was just a question of adapting the theory. There is also evidence for uh, the production of three vector bosons. Again, I leave that just for uh, your leisure to look at it. And I want to move on now to tell you a bit more about the Higgs discovery. So, but before that, just to say, we have measured really many, many standard model uh, processes over a huge range of cross sections and using the same trick as before, namely that we look at the data of a theory, okay, they should all line up at one and to a large extent they do. And I think this is really uh, considered as a triumph of the standard model that it predicts so over so many orders of magnitude cross sections correctly. So this excellent performance for standard model physics really gave us the legitimation to eventually claim uh, discoveries. And as you know, the first discovery and the most important one for the LHC was really the announcement of the Higgs boson. That is now already eight years ago at uh, CERN and also in Melbourne, there was the IJEP uh, conference. It was presented by uh, Joe and Candela for CMS and by Fabiola Cianotti for ATLAS. And this was, of course, a moment of great emotion for Francois Englert and uh, Peter Hicks, who actually met the first time during that seminar at, at CERN. Well, the story is that then the year after, they uh, were awarded the Nobel Prize. Of course, there is one person missing here, namely the collaborator of uh, Francois Englert, uh, Robert Braut, who uh, unfortunately died a couple of years before that date. For us, the experimentalists, it was very nice that in the uh, Nobel citation, also the experiments were mentioned, namely the discovery predicted, they predicted the fundamental particle by the ATLAS and CMS experiments at the CERN Large Hadron Collider. So let me show you now first the Higgs um, events and uh, Higgs peaks and discovery uh, evidence from run one. This is a typical event of a Higgs into gamma gamma. So you see uh, photons in the electromagnetic color meter, which is the green thing, nothing pointing to them, so they are not electrons. Or you see here a display of uh, four muons, each one a pair uh, coming from a Z. So what you see here are the uh, legacy peaks, we say, from Atlas in the Higgs and Gamma Gamma. Uh, you see the normal QCD gamma gamma background, which then, like a bump hunter, you can find, uh, you see an excess of, of data here. Again, we will talk more about bump hunting later on. And uh, also I refer to Alam Gross's uh, lecture about bump hunting. But I think there is no doubt there is a, a peak here. Similarly, in the four leptons, either E plus E minus E plus E minus, mu plus mu minus, mu plus mu minus, or E plus E minus, mu plus mu minus, you see a clear accumulation of events. Uh, just to show you the, the same thing from uh, the CMS experiment, the gamma gamma, and again, an excess uh, for the four lepton case. Now, what is very important is they are all at the same uh, mass. 
Now, so I was showing you only the, the fully reconstructed uh, final states where we see a peak. Here are a lot of other, uh, gives you an idea about the other decay channels for the Higgs boson. So we were looking only at the Higgs and gamma gamma and CZ, but already in the first run, one was also observing the uh, WW, some hint of the BB bar and some hint of the tau, tau plus tau minus uh, decays. And in fact, this uh, is kind of a summary of uh, the run one uh, legacy where we see the expected signal and observed uh, signal significance in ATLAS and in CMS. So you see sometimes the signal is a bit bigger than what you would have expected. Sometimes it is also a, a, a bit smaller or so. And either one can happen, of course. But what is very important is that uh, both experiments have performed very well. And when we were discussing the uh, complementarity of the experiments in all their technologies, this is an important statement. Let me introduce here also something, and I said mu is unfortunately also used for something else, which is called the signal strength. The signal strength is defined as the uh, observed uh, signal or cross-section compared to the expected cross-section from the standard model. So you would expect, if it all just standard model, you would expect this to be at one. And in the, the data, clearly for the different channels at that stage with large errors, uh, confirm signal strengths of one. An interesting uh, funny plot is this here, namely, uh, again, relating a little bit to Elam's uh, lecture. Uh, you can look at the significance of uh, the, the signal. You can ask the question, well, how probable would it be that the background fluctuates to fake the observed excess of events. And for that, I mean of all these channels here, as a function of the mass. And uh, you see that uh, the probability to have a fluctuations is really very, very low. It's actually almost 10 standard deviation, 10 to the minus 23. <clears throat> so it's beyond any doubt, of course, that the new particle had been found, even more so, and very importantly, that it also has been seen independently uh, co-discovered by the CMS experiment. So I just uh, skip over one uh, transparency and go quickly to transparency 141. 141 shows you that uh, also in run two now with uh, much more data, something like almost 140 inverse pentobound and at the higher energy, 13 TV, we have a very nice peak, for example, in the four lepton uh, channel. And from the uh, signal, we can actually fit the mass. And from this single channel, one can uh, extract the mass of 125 GV. That's a number you should remember. And 125 GV is uh, with an error of about, well, 200 uh, MeV at this stage. So it's a very, very precise measurement actually. Similarly, this is the peak for the Higgs into two photons. I think there is no doubt anymore. Uh, and again, from that, for example, CMS has extracted a similar precision of the mass measurement. I said that it's important to measure well the mass of the W of the top and then uh, check for the consistency actually 
of uh, the Higgs mass measurement. In the standard model, they should uh, all agree. You see here the uh, different lines which would correspond to different Higgs masses. And uh, indeed, I think uh, there is a very good <coughs> agreement at the level of one uh, standard deviation. Let me just show you briefly some pictures of the other of some of the other channels. One is uh, the WW channel, where we see here the events which were selected by having an electron and then an opposite side uh, muon. There is quite some background, and of course, we don't see really a uh, sharp mass peak again because of the presence of the neutrinos, but uh, one can model and uh, measure the background from side bands of the distributions very well. And there's a clear access again for uh, the signal at 125 uh, GV or so. This is again the transverse mass and it corresponds to the 125 uh, GV signal in the WW case. One can also with a large number of events, you see here the numbers, uh, start looking at the production uh, mechanism. The uh, Higgs, the largest contribution actually comes from gluon fusion, but there is also a very sizable contribution from vector boson fusion, and you see here the Feynman diagram for that. So you measure simultaneously to the Higgs decay, also uh, two jets, the quarks, which have uh, radiated the W or C, which fused to the Higgs. And then you can compare the cross section, what you predict from the standard model for the uh, gluon fusion, this here, times the branching ratio of the Higgs in WW, the cross section you measure, compare this in a two dimensional plot with the same thing for this diagram. That is what you would expect for the standard model. This is the measurement and it is actually uh, excellent agreement within uh, one standard deviation. Another important uh, measurement is to look at the Higgs into the B BB bar decay. Actually, the by far the largest uh, branching fraction for the Higgs. However, you could not look at it uh, just uh, inclusively because there is so much uh, background. Remember the transparency I showed you about the cross sections of the BB bar uh, production is many, many orders of magnitude above this. So you would have to find the signal among them. This is not possible. So what one does in this case is one looks at the so-called associated production of the Higgs with the W and C, where the W and C can of course be easily recognized by their uh, decays uh, into muons or electrons. And then one can look at the, at the, the BB bar uh, mass and one sees again an excess of events if one makes a subtraction from the background clearly there is an excess at 125 GV and in fact the cross section is well in good agreement with what one expects from the standard model remember this is the signal strengths which defined as observed cross-section over the expected cross-section. In fact, it's here, it's too good almost, it's 1.01. 1 uh, finally, you can, with a large amount of data, you can also look at much more uh, rare decay uh, production mechanism. For example, the direct production 
of a Higgs boson together with uh, top quarks. This is only about 1% of the Higgs are produced in this way. And uh, nevertheless, if you look in a, for example, a scatter plot between the gamma gamma masses you find and the top masses of uh, the primary top quark mass, you find an accumulation of event around 175 GV for the top quark mass, 125 GV for the uh, Higgs uh, boson. And so you can again measure the uh, signal strengths, in this case still with very large error, but uh, being above the five sigma uh, well limit to claim a discovery. Now, what are our next challenges? Our next challenges are to look actually and find the Higgs boson coupling to the second generation. These are just the heavy guys which we were looking so far. Second generation uh, of the uh, quark and leptons. For example, the most promising one is to look for the Higgs into mu plus mu minus. And you see, this is a new result which is just being uh, presented actually at the physics uh, conference, uh, which happens now. Well, you see a first indication at the level of uh, something like two standard deviations. So of course, this is, is a very, interesting hint, but you need much more data to find it really. Similarly, uh, one of the rarity cases which would be very interesting to observe is the Higgs decaying into a Z and a photon. This is a very simple, uh, clean signature in the experiment, but uh, again, you need more data to see. Maybe you start seeing a little, uh, again, a little uh, indication, but uh, more data is really needed. So in a summary, maybe for the Higgs boson production modes and couplings, here are the different production modes, uh, gluon fusion, vector boson fusion, associated production, and uh, associated production with TT bar. These are the measurements and overall the signal strengths, let's say within 10%, agrees with uh, what you expect for the standard model uh, X. One can also uh, plot the couplings to the different uh, particles with using these uh, kind of reduced uh, coupling strengths modifier. You can find in the literature, for example here, this is described they should line on a, a line up like that uh, in as a function of the mass. This is both uh, logarithmic scales and you see within the errors, they do that. Of course, this, however, needs to be populated really with the uh, lighter uh, particles. And that's one of the goals also of the LHC to run then uh, very much uh, higher intensities in the future. So I skip again uh, the transparency and I want just to mention a few searches beyond the standard model. There are many, many searches and maybe uh, one of the uh, most uh, prominent one is to look for uh, supersymmetry, because this would be nice as it could be a explanation for the dark matter in the universe. So I don't have to say much about that because uh, John Ellis was uh, talking about this a lot. Let me just say the basic idea uh, for these searches is to look at signatures where you have missing transverse energy from the lightest supersymmetric particle, which is a neutron, 
and a stable particle which would escape the detector. So it would behave in a way like the neutrinos. Now we have such missing transverse energy because of the neutrinos in the standard model. This is a schematic plot to show you uh, from one of the distributions how the neutrino missing uh, transverse energy well, translate in what is called an effective mass here. And then you would look for something which is even in excess in this missing transverse energy uh, compared to the standard model. And now there are many, many variations. You can do that uh, for different models. You can look for that for uh, strongly uh, produced supersymmetric particles. You can look that for uh, also electroweak uh, produced uh, such uh, particles. Depends. Uh, the cross sections are very well defined. And as you can see immediately, of course, we haven't found any of these. But uh, you can see immediately because the cross section, for example, for uh, gluino pair production or we know uh, or squark pair production. These are these two ones. They are much larger for a given mass. So uh, you expect that the limits on the masses you can arrive at are much higher for the strongly produced guys than, for example, for the electroweak uh, produced ones, which are down here. So. I just want to give you maybe how much time I have. I still have five minutes. So I just want to tell you, give you one example here and there will be more in the slides, but this is, for example, looking into strongly produced luminos and squarks. The simplest would be just to have a squark pair production. The squarks decay into a normal quark, means a jet and the lighter supersymmetric particle, similarly for the other one. So you would have two, but sometimes you have much more jets and missing transverse energy. And this is just one of these things. Uh, plots, for example, the case when you look at the final stage with uh, six jets, and that is what you would expect if you would have uh, produced actually uh, greenos of the order of uh, 1.7 uh, TV in this case, compared to the uh, known processes, which gives you also configurations with many jets, in this case, six jets and uh, missing transverse energy. So this is used then to put uh, limits when you don't uh, observe them. And I guess in the next uh, lecture, Elam will talk about how you produce these limits. And uh, you can see that you can exclude, usually in such plots, the meaning is you exclude what is below the curve. And in this case, you would exclude, for example, uh, greenos and squarks of the order of almost 3 TV here. And I skip uh, the other SUSY plots in order to gain some time. And I just give you a summary of all these uh, different processes which were looked at. Inclusive searches and then third generation searches because there's quite some arguments, theoretical arguments that maybe the lightest uh, guys would be the stop uh, quarks, then electroweak, uh, electroweak production. And you see the, these are, of course, the limits are, this is logarithmic, the limits are lower on the ones which have uh, lower cross sections typically. And here you go up to, for example, 2.3, 2.4 uh, TV on the strong uh, production. 
Another uh, more direct and easy search is to look at heavy guys like WZ-like particles, which could exist. And for example, this here is an event where we have a E plus E minus pair, which makes up an energy, uh, a mass of 4.1 TV. Now, of course, one event is not enough. This is just part of the continuum. We have here the mass spectrum of uh, in a logarithmic scale of electron pairs. Here, the mass spectrum of muon pairs. And uh, what is also indicated is how would such a C prime look like if it would be 2 TV or if it would be 5 TV or so. That's the signal we would expect having this amount of uh, integrated uh, data. You see here one more thing which is uh, interesting, maybe from also the <clears throat> experimental point of view. Opposite behavior of the resolution of uh, electromagnetic calorimeter, which improves the resolution the higher the energy is until you reach a plateau really from the systematic effects. Whereas, of course, to measure really high momentum muons, muons in the, is, which are here, a couple of TV, for example, for a four TV Z prime, you, each muon would have two TVs, becomes more and more difficult, and so the resolution is more difficult. But, of course, you need both in order, if you make a discovery, in order to uh, underline really the nature also that it, such a C prime, for example, would decay uh, into both uh, leptons in a uniform way. So you want to measure both nevertheless. So <clears throat> what is shown here now is uh, the joint. From here, you see we have not seen any resonance. So again, you can um, produce a uh, upper limit, a cross-section limit, and you can confront this cross-section limit with what you would expect for uh, dif different models. For example, the, this here is a sequential, uh, the, the, the one is sequential uh, C prime model. You can see what you would expect as a cross section, and we can exclude uh, cross sections above these uh, measurements. Of course, we cannot say if the cross section will be below, we could not exclude here, but we can exclude up to something like uh, 5 TV. And obviously, the more data you have, the more further out you can uh, exclude such uh, sequential. Z bosons. This is just <clears throat> one illustration. I show you, I skip over the one for the W, so this is similar. Then it's also very interesting to look at um, strong interactions. This is, for example, a two jet event with a mass of 8 uh, TV, and uh, you can see whether in this mass distribution of two jet events, you would see any accumulation. For example, if you would have an excited, <coughs> excited quark, you could expect these are excited quarks of four or five TV. You can see whether you see such a bump. Obviously, you don't. And uh, then you can again, uh, you can arrive at the cross-section limit, which is shown here, and compare it to what the theory, a simple theory, will predict you for the cross-section for such an excited quark. And as you can see, uh, well, we can exclude certainly all masses below something like, in this case, about well, six and a half 
TV or so. Okay, so you can go further and that we will need a lot of data to do this, this uh, exploiting really the whole LHC. You can look at hypothetical uh, particles which would decay into two vector bosons and each of the vector boson into a pair of uh, jet. Now, when the mass of such an object is low, well, they would really uh, decay rather if they are pair produced, they would decay, uh, well, the jets would be very separated. But uh, when there is a huge mass, then of course the W and the Z, they will be very much boosted. And in turn, you could not really see different jets from the W or the Z uh, decay. They would merge. And so one is looking at substructure and there's a lot of um, analysis work and machine learning work going on to extract actually signatures where you cannot see from, from your naked eye that there were uh, two jets, but uh, from the pattern of the energy in the calorimeter and in the tracking, you can still exploit the substructure and giving a higher weight when you see, for example, uh, two clusters like that. So this has been uh, done as well and uh, will be pursued. Uh, as you can see, uh, in these uh, distributions, there is again, no indication for uh, a heavy object decaying into uh, two vector bosons. And uh, that uh, such objects are actually uh, predicted, for example, in extra dimensional uh, models, for example, by uh, Lisa Randall and uh, Raman Sundru. This is when they visited the Atlas control room together with Fabiola Gianotti. So again, this can be used to uh, set limits not very high yet in this case of some 2 TV for uh, such objects. Okay, there are many, many such uh, searches which are being done. And again, this is a summary of, uh, of typical limits. And as we have seen some of these limits, for example, for, uh, for C primes or so, they go into the many TV almost reaching uh, 10 TV. This is one TV, 10 TV. You have here uh, the archive um, numbers if you want to look at one of these papers in particular. So I'm coming to the end. I just want to say that uh, we are only at the beginning really of uh, the LHC operation. In fact, we are now what is called the long shutdown tool. Initially, we thought we would re-operate the machine again in 2021, but because of COVID and other, uh, some other delays, it has been um, agreed that we start again in February 2022. And then we may run something like until the mid to the end of 2035, 2040 maybe, accumulating something like three to four uh, inverse, uh, a thousand inverse femtobahn. In the meantime, there are a lot of upgrades of the detector going on in the first phase to be installed for this uh, startup in 22 and then uh, big upgrades for the installation in the years 2025 typically. So just to give you an idea, we are here now with accumulated data and uh, 
we still will go on up to three inverse autobahns, maybe four inverse autobahns. In the transparency, you will see some information about the upgrades, which I skip here because I'm out over time and I come to my last slide. I just want to uh, well recall from the two lectures that uh, really the ATLAS experiment when building the instrument then installing it, commissioning it, its operation, physics analysis has really been a very rewarding journey for thousands of colleagues. Same, of course, for CMS and the other experiments, which I could not talk so much about. Now, I want to stress that, of course, this journey was not starting from zero. It was a fantastic adventure, which really uh, continued a fruitful tradition of exploring the high energy frontier with Hadron machines from the ISR to the CERN PYP collider to the Tevatron and of course culminating now with the LHC. And there's also still a lot of physics to come with the what is called the high luminosity LHC and uh, a lot of interesting detector work to be done in the upgrade of the experiments. So thank you very much for your attention. Hi, Peter. Thank you very much uh, for this comprehensive uh, review. Uh, there are certainly a lot of uh, success of the LHC, Atlas and CMS have performed uh, quite uh, admirably. In many cases, uh, more than we expect. And we, I want people to understand that uh, Peter here led the Atlas experiment for many, many years through uh, the construction phase. And so um, it was due to his leadership, uh, which uh, made uh, possible the realization of Atlas. And also that legacy that he passed on to uh, the spokesperson that came after him, including uh, Fabiola, Dave Charlton, now Karl Yakov, and soon, uh, um, Andreas Hoke? Yeah, Andreas Hoke. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and the other thing I want to say is that uh, we have some groups in uh, Atlas uh, from African countries. Uh, Morocco has been in Atlas, I think, since 2001, has a lot of universities uh, in the cluster there. In 2013, we had an Atlas week in Morocco that draw upwards of uh, a few hundred people for one week. And then um, Peter also was instrumental to get South Africa uh, involved in Atlas. It was uh, a lot of effort, also even personal effort, personal commitment from Peter himself um, to really make sure that uh, the South African um, uh, you know, get into Atlas, which happened officially in 2010. Uh, right now, the South African uh, group uh, are clustered into the South Africa CERN consortium, which also includes the Atlas people, uh, the people who are working on in Isolde, and also the theories. And the Atlas Group in South Africa has grown since 2010 when they joined with just two institutes. Um, so, so Peter came to us with a lot of uh, personal commitment to uh, make sure that uh, African countries are represented in this large scale experiment. Even go beyond that, um, there is the Atlas Thesis Award which I believe at least a few um, students from uh, African institutes have benefited from that. This includes uh, Chilufia, who uh, recently got her PhD on Atlas. 
and she's coming to start her postdoc with uh, Brookhaven, still on Atlas. And also, um, um, Hasne, yeah. Hasne El Jarari from uh, Morocco is currently uh, uh, stationed at CERN with uh, the Atlas uh, Thesis uh, Award. Um, so there is a lot of work that Peter was, you know, uh, maybe too humble to mention himself, but uh, um, is somebody who has really been committed to promoting uh, fundamental physics in Africa and making sure that uh, there is a representation of African Institute. Uh, there were other stuff, even financial commitments that have to be worked out and Peter found solution for this institute to uh, remain afloat and remain, uh, uh, you know, a contributing part of the global effort of, uh, of Atlas. Uh, so we hope that going into the future, the high luminosity LHC, what comes uh, afterwards, all of those things, we hope that uh, there will be more and more uh, involvement of African institutes um, that we can extend um, that uh, sort of scientific tie to other African countries uh, as well. Um, so Peter, I on, I on the behalf of all of my colleagues from the continent, I really want to thank you for what you have done and you are continuing to do and it's, uh, it's really uh, appreciated. Um, so um, on, on that note, I, if people have questions and comments, uh, uh, either on the lectures from last week and the one from today, uh, any other things you want to ask Peter? Uh, so he's available and please, uh, you know, please talk. Well, first of all, thank you very much, Ketevi. You have you exaggerate, of course, a bit, but uh, it's clear it will be, as I mentioned in the first lecture also, uh, Atlas is, is open and uh, we should work for the future to make the African community in, in uh, Atlas uh, larger, of course. Yes, I, I see here Professor Raja Cherkawi from uh, Morocco. Um, so um, she too is uh, one of our big leaders and promoting um, fundamental science in, in, in Africa. Maybe Raja, you want to say something? It's, it's really a pleasure to see you connected. Hi. Hi, Raja. <laughs> Peter, how are you? Kitibi, how are you? Hi, Raja, I'm doing pleasure fine. To, Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to listen to, to Peter and uh, to show all the history of LHC and for uh, Atlas. It's a big pleasure. And uh, I think Morocco is uh, a part of Atlas uh, thanks to, to Peter. He came, he came in Morocco, he met our ministry and he present all the things uh, and what all the things he 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 said about was good and uh, it's uh, thanks to him that we are in Atlas and uh, thank you also Peter to present all the things and the future of Atlas of course because no Morocco will be in an upgrade first it's not clear but not uh, today it's clear. So it was a pleasure for us to be, uh, uh, for our young researcher to be a uh, member and uh, to participate uh, to this uh, great uh, experiment. So thank you, uh, KTV, and thank you for organizing this uh, presentation. And Peter, also, thank you for all the things. And I hope we will meet uh, again. Thank you. Thank you for your kind words. Of course, you and uh, South African uh, Institute and so you are in, in Atlas because of you, not of me. But it was always a pleasure uh, to help and uh, 
Yeah, I'm still motivated to continue that, and indeed, I hope this uh, will be possible again uh, very soon. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Raja. Um, thanks very much. It's, uh, yeah, we hope that uh, um, sometime next year we'll come back to Morocco and, and finish uh, ASP 2020 as uh, we originally started to work on it. Yes. So let's hope that the situation improves so that we can, we can meet in person. Yes, I hope <clears throat> so. Um, so anybody has questions or comments? Hi. Hi, Mohammed. Go ahead. Uh, so uh, first, thanks for the nice talk. You're it welcome. Was it was really comprehensive. So uh, you showed in one of the slides all the channel uh, for the heat decay. So, um, so uh, my question is, do we have, do we discover all these channels? Can we see them? Or we still have some to search? Okay, let, let me, no, we have not seen yet all at, we have, uh, let me just, Go back, maybe. I think you prefer. When I show this was. Oops, this one, maybe. Yes. Yeah. Yes, this so, one. This one. So, what we have seen is for the discovery really was because it gives a peak nicely the gamma gamma and the z z z. Then we have measured the WW. We have uh, measured the tau tau. And in uh, associate production, we have measured the BB bar. But we have not directly seen only a hint of the mu plus mu minus. And of course, we are far, far away from uh, seeing uh, particles of the first uh, generation, like uh, the E plus C minus. That's a very, very tiny uh, branch interaction. Remember, the, <clears throat> the Higgs likes really to uh, couple to the heavy guys. In fact, what you see here is, uh, so it, it likes very much to couple at the uh, heavy guys and uh, this is essentially the ones which we saw with the exception of the gamma gamma where it it's goes through a loop. So there is still a, a lot to be uh, measured on the, on the Higgs, just on, uh, on the different um, channels. In fact, one of the uh, interesting features of the Higgs is also uh, that it could very well couple to invisible things. And in fact, Ketebi is one of the experts, <clears throat> for example, in making uh, Higgs uh, uh, searches where the Higgs would couple at uh, invisible particles. These invisible particles, it could be, for example, uh, could be dark matter, if the dark matter, of course, is relatively light. Could also be some other, other hypothetical particles. So uh, we have certainly only measured uh, some of the, of the possibilities. And uh, also these possibilities we have typically measured at the precision of uh, well, between maybe eight and, and 20% or eight and 30% in, in some cases. Even. So there is <clears throat> there's still a lot to be, to be done. Then one of the very important things which I had no time really to go into is one has, uh, and one of the goals of still of the LHC uh, high luminosity and then even of future machine is to see whether the Higgs 
actually couples to itself. It's called the self-coupling. You could observe pairs of Higgs produced. Uh, that would be one. So the short answer is no, we have not measured all these, uh, these branching fractions yet. Thank you. Peter, I, I, uh, I'm working with Mohammed on Higgs to Invisible. Ah, very uh, good. So he's, he's a graduate student uh, from Morocco, uh, working with Farida. And yeah. uh, so we are all working together on, on the Higgs to Invisible channel. So Mohammed himself now knows quite a lot about the Higgs to Invisible search. Yeah, that's a, that, I think that's a very interesting one, of course, an interesting channel. Yes, sure. Thank you. So, um, so uh, Ben Brick, you have you have a question. You said, uh, "Is this Mohammed? yes? Yes, go ahead. Yes, thank you very much, uh, P uh, KTV. Thank you very much, Peter, for this nice uh, uh, talk. I just want to ask about, of course, about the invisible Higgs decays. Do you think that the that the now the, the 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 discrepancies between the theory, including high order corrections and the experiments, including uh, uh, high luminosities, in the future will in the few, in the in the run three, the beginning of run three will reduce. I mean, will reduce this gap between the invisible. I mean, the decay the decay of uh, Higgs at some uh, particles? This is one question. I mean, uh, the second one is that we, we, we heard some Z gamma excess from, uh, I think, <clears throat> from, uh, from some uh, uh, talks, uh, experimentalist people. Uh, they, they, do you think that the Z, Z gamma is still a really a big problem? In the in the in the for the LRC, for example. Thank you very much. Well, <clears throat> to the second uh, to the second question, let me share this and and we have actually. I showed you, of course, everything went very fast. This is, I think, Atlas is the only experiment which has shown really the the Z gamma. And as you can see, we, we need more data really to, to measure this. Um, maybe you have seen this data and that's what you're referring to. Now, uh, this is interesting because there are some uh, models where a rather large uh, a large, relatively speaking, large branching fraction in, of the Higgs into Z gamma are uh, predicted. We seem to uh, we seem to exclude that, but uh, okay. What we exclude is at the moment up to a uh, cross section which would be uh, three point six times the standard model uh, cross-section. So okay, if you make a model which uh, says it's only a change by 20% or so, it would be far away from being able to, uh, to detect this. So this needs much more data. Okay. Now for the invisible, uh, clearly with more data, I think one would uh, restrain more and more the uh, still possible invisible decay of the Higgs. Now, there I just hand over to, to Katevi or Muhammad or so, who know much better than, than me what is really uh, the, the limits. Yeah, no, at the, at the moment we have uh, uh, atla li Atlas limits of uh, the branching ratio at 20%, 95% confidence level, only in the channel of uh, the vector boson fusion. Yeah. And uh, so, and, and that's 
basically the best limit we have at the LHC at the moment are twelve percent. Um, then Mohammed and 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 some of our other colleagues are not only working on the full paper for the for the uh, vector boson fusion, but as well uh, on the combination with other channels um, that yes. presumably will bring, will make the better limit. Um, and then, then, so, you know, we might get to 10, 9%, 9, 9 with all combined channel at the moment. And then when we go to run three, and, uh, and, and beyond, uh, as Peter said, we, we will continue the search. Some channel might become better than others. Right now it's the VBF that's dominating, but the associated possession with a Z or a W as well might become uh, uh, a major contributing uh, channel to the overall combined limit. So uh, our plan is actually, at least my plan, is to continue in run three with uh, some of the Moroccan group. So I just, I mentioned Mohammed, who is working with uh, Farid Fassi. So uh, we meet on a weekly basis to review the progress. And, uh, and this is going into the thesis of Mohammed. So we have now established a, a, a very good collaboration in that, in that, in that, on the Higgs from Invisible Channel. So, so uh, we, we, we will carry it forward in run three where we expect that we'll get much better uh, limit if we don't have an excess. Okay, okay, very good. <clears throat> so Rashid, by the way, thank you very much for connecting. For the people who don't know Rashid, uh, he's a professor at uh, uh, Kadi Ayad University in uh, Marrakesh. Where ASP 2020, uh, you know, was supposed to be to have taken place. Um, so uh, he's he's a theorist, uh, um, high energy theorist. So uh, it's very, it's really an honor to have you also present, Rashid. Thank you, thank you very much, thank you. I'm, I'm very happy. I would like to, to to participate with you in this discussion, which I I appreciated very very much. Thank you very much for all of you. Thanks. Um, other question? Hola, it looks like you were talking before. Did you have a question? Uh, yeah. Um, I, I think I, I, I might have missed, missed what, what the reason was, but then can you please go to, back to the slide with the branching ratios for the Higgs decays? Yeah, okay, I will try. Yes, yeah. and then I have to go like that, I think. Yeah. It's like a pie chart, yeah, this one. Yeah, here it's, yeah. Yeah, uh, I, I think I might have missed, or missed the reason why you, 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 you if, if you might have mentioned the reason, but I know that the, 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 the Higgs, two, Higgs decaying to two bottom quarks was only relatively recently discovered <clears throat> as compared to the Higgs decaying to, to two Z bosons and Higgs yeah. to gamma gamma, for instance. I was wondering why. <clears throat> ah, why okay. Yeah, that's a good question. You see, um, as I tried to mention, the Higgs into BB bar, you cannot search in a just in an inclusive way because the background is so enormous. Let me go. I want to show you again this plot here. Ah, this here. You see, it's the cross section for just inclusive PP bar pairs at the LHC is very large, much, much larger several orders of magnitude than, for example, to look at, to produce WZ, which are visible, or anything of uh, the Higgs. This is the Higgs standard model, uh, and we would have to look at this, the mass of 125 GV. 
So you can see it's it's really many orders of magnitude uh, smaller. So to find a uh, bump in the BB bar uh, jet uh, mass spectrum at 125 GV inclusively would just be not possible. So you have to to combine this. I'll give you after I'm done. Okay. You have to combine it with uh, with some other signature. The way it's done, <clears throat> it's uh, done in this case, uh, looking at the associate production with the WRNSE. And, uh, and then you can look <clears throat> at uh, the BB bar uh, mass spectrum in events where you have already detected the W on the Z. So this is much more, much rare. It's not just the branching ratio of the hits, but it's a, it's a much smaller cross section to produce this. So that's why it took uh, a longer time. Also, you can see the signal is not standing out so easily. You have to make a very sophisticated analysis, still having already a tag, as we call it, a tag that it was produced together with the W or the Z. So it's not the pure branching fraction which, which uh, is at play, but it's also uh, one has to dig it out of the of the background. So that the the, the Higgs in that uh, Feynman diagram. <coughs> Does it, could it also decay into a W or a Z still? Yeah, yeah, that it can as well. That's correct. It can, it can, the Higgs can decay in all its, uh, well, it, the Higgs does not uh, know how it was actually produced. It decays uh, with all these probabilities. So you can also find in the same way in associated production, you could find the Higgs decaying into, uh, into taus. And in fact, that is one of the channels which, which have been looked at. Mm. Okay. okay, thank you so much. Yeah. I, I was just wondering if I have in my spare slides here, uh, the cross section, I should have put this, but I'm not sure. I, Maybe we have, I have it, maybe not. No, I don't. Unfortunately, I don't know, I don't have it. So um, you can certainly find very easily in the literature, uh, the, the cross section, production cross section and, and uh, branching ratios of um, the Higgs as a function of the mass. And so you have to go to the, the mass of 125 GV. Unfortunately, I don't have the slide in my spares here. Okay. Yeah, okay. Um, if you know, we, we have uh, talked for quite some time and uh, um, you know, if, if uh, the students in particular, you have uh, any question for Peter, uh, you can email him. His email address is on the, on the agenda page. Um, but I would suggest that uh, we stop for now. And uh, we'll continue on Thursday with uh, Ilam Gross lecture on uh, the look elsewhere effect in, in searches. Yeah, uh, you will Peter. be well. Yes. Yeah, you will be welcome also to send to send me an email. It's just uh, my mail address is very simple. It's just my first name, point Jenny at CERN.ch. If you have a question, on, you you will be always welcome to to ask a question like that. Yeah. Um... Yeah, okay, yes. So Peter, on the behalf of everybody, uh, I would like to thank you for uh, volunteering to give these lectures. Uh, it's uh, very, very uh, interesting and very nice. Uh, Peter was supposed to actually come to Morocco to the African School of Physics and 
actually give these lectures in person. Um, so we will have the opportunity to have him when uh, the situation improves and we can all meet together. And uh, so we have an opportunity to see Peter at that point. Awesome. So thanks everybody. And uh, so uh, I wish you stop for now and uh, have a great rest of the day and week. Okay, bye-bye everybody. Bye-bye, thank you. Ciao. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, Peter, I like it too. Bye-bye, Roger, ciao.